So some of the main symptoms of low testosterone, first of all, would be increased body fat. So most men that have low testosterone levels actually find it easier to put on weight. Testosterone promotes pro-social behaviors, but I think a lot of men are feeling like they can't actually be the man that they actually want to become because they feel like they have to suppress those behaviors or they can't like lead or dominate and things like that. My mission was just to max out testosterone as, as high as possible naturally. If you want to like get super lean, like that is one way to do it. Like sprint training will definitely get you shredded. When it comes to supplements for testosterone production, there are many different applications for different compounds. So for example, Lucas, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. We made the diaries work and we're here. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm joining you all the way from down under in Australia. So it's six o'clock on a Monday night here. So yeah, looking forward to chatting. Yes, sir. And I want to start with a phrase that you use regularly. And that is, you are not the same man your grandfather was. Why is that? It's a great question. Um, well, really, if we look back at the generational decline levels in testosterone, I mean, we're seeing a, a significant drop off in testosterone levels across most men across the world. Um, and so in terms of, you know, what we're seeing nowadays is that there's a massive issue with men is that they're, they're facing these low levels of testosterone and many of them are uneven, not even, not even aware that they're struggling with, you know, low testosterone. They'll go to their doctor, you know, they'll present typical symptoms of like low mood, low motivation, you know, lack of resilience. And really a lot of the time it can be dialed back to, low levels of testosterone and so if we look at you know the man our grandfather was you know back then the average levels of testosterone were a lot higher than what they are today and so this is impacting men not only in the gym and physically like physical performance but i think the main benefits that we're really missing out on are the mental the mental benefits. And I'm sure, you know, you know quite a lot about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you're completely right to use that phraseology to kind of compare where we were versus our, our forefathers and who came before us. Because many of the ills that modern men face, I don't want to use a, um, a razor to solve every single problem, but there's a lot that points towards the fact that men are feeling less empowered than they were previously, less focused than they were previously, less strong than they were previously, less resilient, which was a key term that you've used already. And guess what? When you have an understanding of what's happening with testosterone, it would maybe start to make a lot of sense. And there's a stat that I see people quote all the time that is falling annually by 1%. Those 1% add up. It's a thing called compound interest. And we end up in a position where, as you've explained, the test level of our the average grandfather is so much higher than the grandson these days and that is across the board it's not a it's not a a, a one-off example it is is across the board with men across the world mm. and also as part of that uh that issue is the wider consequences associated with that like we look at it from like a interpersonal consequence in terms of like productivity at work um you know relationship stress for example you know, we're seeing men nowadays just finding it more challenging to, I guess, just cope with modern day living. And that, that you know, that appears to be a really big issue. And even, you know, stemming from that is lack of confidence. You know, a lot of men these days are really struggling to, you know, back themselves. If we get into what are some of the symptoms of low T, because you've flagged there that some men don't even consider it that that might be an issue for them. Yeah, so some of the main symptoms of low testosterone, first of all, would be um, increased body fat. So most men that have low testosterone levels actually find it easier to, you know, um, put on weight, for example. Um, but other physical symptoms could be difficulty building muscle, um, low libido, lack of morning wood, um, low mood, low motivation. So I mean, the the, the symptoms can be very broad. Um, but yeah, most guys just really, really struggle in terms of the, the motivation and drive. They apply across the board, don't they? And like, when I think of a lot, a lot of conversations I've had around dopamine, which I'm sure we'll get onto serotonin, all these different hormones that are going on inside the brain. I think Andrew Huberman's done a tremendous job in making it a little bit more into the mainstream. But I certainly think that when you understand that testosterone is like a driving factor behind how men behave, 
you can see why there's this kind of crisis of like I call it like almost listlessness, like living life on autopilot. So drifting from the job that you hate to the three hours of Netflix at night with the the porn on your phone and the vape in your hand and just drifting through life in a way that's just so meaningless and ultimately not pleasurable and not uh, gratifying in the longer term. And when you understand mm. that if testosterone's on a low level, you see why somebody would fall into that cycle and not have a a real drive to get out of it. They probably internally have some sort of um, poor conversation with themselves about not really enjoying it and not being fulfilled. And the men's mental health crisis could definitely correlate with testosterone drops. But if somebody is stuck in these circumstances, our natural predisposition to drive forward as a man and do things as a man, when it's stifled, you see why so many people are stuck in the rut. Absolutely, man. Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think it's a it's a problem that really, I would say, thankfully to to guys like Dr. Andrew Huberman, Ben Greenfield, and some other like Dave Asprey, some of these other like OG biohackers. You know, it's great to see that they're finally starting to address it and talk about it and raise it as a as an issue because, like I said, it, it can also be like very difficult for a man to know as well, and this is why it really comes down to getting blood tests done. And this is something that I always, I'm sure you do the same thing, Colin, is, you know, with, with the blood work, it's, it's imperative we do that at least twice a year, you know, assessing for things like free testosterone, total testosterone, SHBG, you mean, there's so many different parameters that we need to check to make sure that we're functioning op- optimally. Data is power. I, com- I completely agree. But one thing I want to do before we get into a data side of things is understand what's happening on an environmental level, because we're not talking about a small number of men seeing random drops in testosterone. We're talking about a nationwide, worldwide drop in testosterone for men. What are some of the factors that are contributing towards that? Yeah, first and foremost, um, from an environmental perspective, definitely exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs, you know, things like xenoestrogens, which are found in even simple things like storing your food in plastic containers and then throwing that, you know, plastic container into a, into a microwave and then heating up your food, the typical chicken, broccoli, rice, bodybuilding style, style diet, um, you know, that, that can be a problem because these plastics actually leach out into the food. And to explain it on a very simple, like in simple terms, these xenoestrogens or these plastics, basically what they do is they build up inside the body, even though we're ingesting very, very small amounts over time, what happens is they start to build up and accumulate inside the body and they can block the testosterone, these androgen receptors, and they can actually activate the estrogen receptors or the estrogen, you know, these are receptors where estrogen binds to. So they can actually exert an estrogenic effect in men. And this can be seen in in examples of like gynecomastia or man boobs, um, reproductive issues such as like low fertility and things like that. So I think, yeah, first and foremost, from an environmental perspective, I think men should be avoiding drinking from plastic bottles, you know, avoid you know, tap water, um, storing food in plastic containers. I mean, I'm sure you're fully, fully across that as well. Yeah, it, I, it was a real red pill that I, a red pill I had to take. And I think the environmental design and convenience is so high that when you start to shun these things, people do look at you like you're crazy. But if you're anything like me over the last few years, people have thought you were crazy for a little <laughs> period. But a lot of people have also started to nod along with uh, what you were thinking for for a very long time when it comes to maybe other geopolitical matters. But I really, really think that when you start to understand some of the things around their environment that are convenient, that are causing problems, you have to understand that there's a there's a trade-off that you have to make for improving your test levels, but maybe losing out on some of the things that are easier about modern day life that can come to you. So things like um, uh, non-stick pans, uh, cooking cooking all my uh, my meals in the oven in in glass Tupperware, uh, sorry glass glassware rather than Tupperware, and that was a big move away because as you said, chicken broccoli rice. Like I thought I was doing the right thing by carrying my food around in in, in, in plastic and getting my meals in, which is a, a huge part of the equation in terms of body composition. But in terms of your hormonal profile and how you feel over a longer period, 
making sure that you're using some of these things is 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 absolutely vital and the big thing that i remember like kind of really pushing forward is like everyone needs to if you're having protein shakes you need to swap to a metal shaker why are you using a plastic shaker yeah. one it stinks but that that should be a sign like <laughs> This is probably not a good idea. That 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 smell, that pungent uh, kickback, is a is, is is a red flag that we should have taken warning of. Oh, hundred percent. Ah, it's a a perfect example. And even with um, you know, with with the food prep side of things, I mean, there's even like looking at the different types of foods that that men eat nowadays. I mean, we're seeing a trend towards like soy milk, you know, and soy soybeans, like consuming soy based foods, like these. are even though in the literature you see that they don't really affect testosterone levels in healthy men, what they will affect is SHBG, free testosterone, and also DHT. Uh, but we can we'll probably get to that shortly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I was going to say from a, a food perspective, low fat is something that's been flagged. And uh, I always see that a lot of bodybuilding diets are low fat, and I've prepped for shoots and um uh, like uh, different uh, promo events before and I've gotten very very lean I hold a very lean physique naturally and um, through my habits of course but eating a really low fat diet can have a big impact on how well your testosterone produces and equally the quality of fat as well because in, with, with like an if it fits your macro style or flexible dieting approach you maybe fill your fats with junk rather than good quality foods and we'll get onto some of the solutions as, as we go um Lucas, but when your fats start to drop low and like good quality fats start to drop low, that is also having an impact on your body's ability to to produce test too. Great example. I mean, if we look at the types of fatty acids or the types of fats that most men are leaning towards nowadays is the actually the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these are the poofers, which I'm sure you're familiar with, like canola oil, safflower oil, sun sunflower oil. Um, soybean oil, all of these oils that are considered like vegetable oils are actually the ones that are actually suppressing testosterone production um, because of their pro-inflammatory state. Instead, we want to be aiming for things like coconut oil, butter, olive oil, ghee, um, you know, these higher monounsaturated fats and, and, and saturated yeah, fats. It's funny you bring up soy as well because there's the meme online of like a soy boy who's like somebody with like a soft rig that's very effeminate and not very able to stand up for himself. And sometimes the bro science in the meme is correct when you distill it down. And as you were saying there, perhaps it's not impacting the the super healthy guy that much, but it's almost a compounding effect for the guy that's in a state where he's got poor exercise habits. He's um, drinking out of plastic all day long. He's maybe drinking alcohol as well, which is maybe something that we should we should we should address too, because it can sometimes be the the elephant in the room that people don't want to address and talk about that their drinking habit might be a reason why their testosterone levels are not where they could be. It's a great example. It's something that I often overlook in terms of when, even when I'm screening clients or like working with clients, I just assume, I just assume everyone's in the same circle as me and they just don't drink alcohol. <laughs> but then I forget that, you know, most people actually do drink and some people drink frequently. And specifically when we, when we look at like how that can affect hormonal status in men i mean alcohol accelerates the conversion of testosterone into estrogen so it's a highly estrogenic drink um and it can also damage the testes ethanol is known to be a can cause testicular oxidative stress which is not a good thing to to introduce into the body and, and by no means is any amount of alcohol safe for human consumption i mean you'll see some you know, red wine studies here and there. And like all, every now and then they'll say like, oh, you know, if you have a glass of red wine, maybe once every couple of weeks, I mean, is that going to make a difference? Probably not. Like it's probably okay. But um, if we look at it from like a therapeutic perspective, there is no amount of alcohol that is actually safe for human consumption. It's fascinating. And I have had this conversation so many times in, in Scotland, there's a massive drinking culture when you grow up. And I certainly like burnt through it. Like I had my fun when I was younger. It was used as a soap lubricant. It was like good fun and I enjoyed it. But as a more developed and actualized man now, I genuinely have drank a handful of times over the last five years. In fact, I did a 900 period, a 900 day period where I didn't drink whatsoever. I just didn't feel the need for it. And I haven't drank in the UK in a long, long time. I think I drank at a beach party in Dubai and a boat party in Dubai in December, and it felt like it was it was it was worth it because it heightened the experience. But overall, if you look at the big picture, 
I'm looking after my body and my mind in a, in a, in a much stronger way. And people wonder why people like ourselves are able to naturally have relatively good testosterone levels and maintain a good physique, maintain drive, maintain hunger. There's often a reason for that as well. And um, I've, I've had a, a British neuroscientist on called TJ Power, and he was speaking about the, the kind of three or four day period afterwards where serotonin and dopamine and all these different hormones are impacted as well guess what? Those are linked to your test production as well. So on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when you're feeling like feeling like shit, there's a lot of factors that are going on inside your body that are really dragging you down. And that mean that your training suboptimal, it means your energy and work suboptimal, it means your sex drive might be all over the place as well. People talk about a hangover horn, but often that disappears not long after as well, because you're just depleted. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, one thing people forget is like, if alcohol is known to be a toxin in the human body, the body is smart. It will try and detoxify the alcohol, but at the expense of wasting energy and resources and allocating its energy budget towards detoxification of that toxin, when instead if that toxin wasn't introduced into the body in the first place, it could prioritize its resources and energy towards the anabolic hormones like growth hormone, testosterone, um, so really, I'm just not not a fan of of alcohol. Yeah, you brought up tap water, and that for me is one of the biggest challenges. Um, in Scotland, we have actually pretty good tap water compared to other nations, anyway. Especially when I go down to England with work or with clients, I really, really notice the difference. The water is a lot harder, and that's because there's a number more chemicals in it. What are the main concerns when it comes to tap water? <clears throat> Yeah, the way I like to describe tap water um, is actually came up with a saying, which is like chemical soup. Um, so the reason for that is because, you know, tap water is, it depends where you live, but most countries, they they actually add fluoride into the tap water. And, you know, you'll see it quite heavily debated whether or not, you know, we actually need fluoride in our tap water or if, if it's actually healthy. But, you know, my stance is I personally don't think we should be adding fluoride to tap water um, and when we look at what the consequences are from drinking tap water because I mentioned you know before that it's basically chemical soup there's a lot of other chemicals that are found within you know tap water there's a lot of things called heavy metals you know arsenic cadmium lead you know nickel all these heavy metals they can accumulate and saturate in into the body and specifically into the brain so that's not something we want to be doing on a daily basis. And this is something that I encourage pretty much all men is to make sure they're using like a high quality water filter or that they're buying glass bottles like this one here, um, you know, Capi or San Pellegrino, or whatever, the, whatever you can get um, just to, you know, make sure that you're consuming high quality water because that's the one thing you can't. You know, you can't go a day without water. Exactly that. And it, it, it's a genuinely healthy habit to consume X number of liters per kilo of body weight or whatever metric you want to work towards. <clears throat> but when you're maybe putting in stuff that doesn't have a high return on it, then that's a, that, that, that's a real, real challenge. One thing that I found is when you take off a filter to clean it, you realize what has oh, been yeah. filtered out. So that's the only thing that I would say to anyone that's maybe skeptical about filtering their water take the filter off and you'll see how much crap it's filtering out that you would have otherwise have drank. And that for me was a little bit of a, a shocking moment. And again, it's moving away from something that's convenient. And I, I will say for Scottish listeners to reassure you, there isn't fluoride in our, in our, in our tap water, but there are a number of other uh, challenges. You mentioned the, the, the metals, etc. as well. One thing I want to move on to is understanding why we want high tea because we've spoken about how men are in like a a suboptimal state with this low tea. They're not resilient. They're a bit weaker. On the flip side, what are the benefits that lie in weight? Well, I mean, if you look at the men that want to conquer, crush the day, you know, dominate, build a business, be productive, come home, have enough energy to be with their kids or their family and come home, have enough energy to maybe go to the gym and train. These are the guys that have high testosterone. These are not the guys that have low testosterone. So if we look at the main benefits associated with high testosterone, it's actually 
we see, and this is what I've seen even with blood work, I've looked at thousands of different blood, blood test results over the years and I've come to realize that those men are the ones that actually are very productive in society. You know, they're the ones that are actually making changes. They're, they're contributing, they're adding value to the world. And this is something that I'm very passionate about um, because I'm all about contributing to society, wanting to give back, wanting to... I've always had this belief that if you know something that can benefit you know, that can benefit the world, you might as well share it. Like I've always held that stance and that philosophy. Um, but if we look at like the main benefits associated with high testosterone, we're looking at physical energy. A lot of guys report having a lot and abundance of physical energy and they're not really feeling like they're getting burnt out. Um, they are very confident in the way that they act. So they don't really second guess themselves. They don't really overthink um, and then obviously great sexual performance. That's a nice added bonus, you know, feeling great in the bedroom is a nice, you know, nice plus. Um, and then finally looking at the effects on like aerobic performance, you know, we've actually seen studies suggesting that testosterone not only enhances athletic performance in the gym, you know, lifting weights, but even enhancing endurance and stamina, which is a big one. Yeah. I think it's really exciting. And some of the ones that you've mentioned there I think are underrated and that calmness and assured nature of how you hold yourself is really prevalent mm. among men that have either naturally high levels of tea or enhanced levels of, of, of tea as well. And just the way that they hold themselves in a room and the ability to go in and feel good. I think that is a, a big contributing factor. And we'll get onto my own testosterone levels as we, as, as we go with this, but I certainly feel that when I'm nailing, a lot of the variables in my life with my training, my diet, my sleep, my recovery, some of these natural things that we're going to speak about in terms of um, managing T levels. I feel great. I come on these calls. I can talk to whoever it is in my day job. I can pitch to finance directors, managing directors of huge firms, and I'm feeling good. If I'm in a social situation, I don't need the beer or the vodka in my hand. I can go and talk to whoever you want me to and, 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 and be charismatic and, and confident in the person I've created. But I think that that's like an underrated aspect of like, oh, people do think of the physical side of things in terms of getting a bit more jacked or being able to have have fantastic sex or really like strong erections, which are obviously vital for men to have a high quality life. But having like a purposeful nature and assured nature about yourself, that's something that I think we all would want to unlock at some level within our capability. It's a great point. And also you mentioned, you know, that calm and like assured nature, that one there is actually extremely important to, to address because a lot of men think that testosterone promotes aggression and, you know, these volatile behaviors, but that's actually a lot of the steroids trend below and all the, you know, the heavy hitting, heavy hitting steroids that can actually, you know, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing the limits too far. Um, with some of these compounds and that's really what can exacerbate some of these side effects. When you look at men that are naturally, that have high testosterone, they're actually, they, have, they demonstrate, I remember the very first post that I made, Colin, was actually on Instagram. The very first post that I made when I started my Instagram profile was testosterone promotes pro-social behaviors. That was literally the very, you know, if I look back, that post was like five years old now. Um, and so that's like something that I'm, you know, very passionate about. I think that's such a good point because as you said, there is that connotation of the guy that gets angry, the roided up bodybuilder that punches someone outside a nightclub or beats up on the bouncers and the press are all too keen to jump on that. But there's many men who've chosen to address this or to focus on this or naturally are predisposed to, to have really high levels. They walk around calm, assured, confident. Many, like if you picture many like quite strong CEOs or people managers who like guide people through things. They are typically people that have relatively good levels of testosterone because they're able to deal with the pressure of a situation. They're able to be resilient. They're able to be calm. They're able to provide the leadership and drive and focus. And these are all really positive traits. Whereas if you are thinking about somebody that gets quote unquote roid rage, that's immediately something that's you should, you should have like nobody, nobody wants that. Nobody's like aspiring to have that. Exactly. No, spot on. In terms of other areas that I think are, are really positive as well, you mentioned sex life and we are in a situation where 
more young people than ever before are actually not having sex and we're, we're 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 trapped in social media dating apps and swiping and this weird culture and i'm not somebody that's going to shout about the benefits of hookup culture whatsoever but if people are having less sex i think one of the factors we should consider is that young men's testosterone is lower than it was previously as well and it might be a driving factor where there's not the drive and the focus to actually go and do the thing and they're instead satisfying and satiating themselves with like porn or social media or only fans or whatever other junk they're putting into their system yeah it's a it's a big problem we're seeing nowadays with the younger generation and in particular we're noticing that these younger men are actually leaning towards viagra cialis and other medications when really a lot of those issues might actually be stemming from low testosterone um, but if, if you know you've got young guys listening to this podcast you know if they're maybe like 21 to 25 years of age if they are suffering from erection issues, there could actually be a deeper underlying reason for that. It could be potentially cardiovascular issues that you know need to be addressed. There could be psychological factors that could be playing a role. Trauma could be blood flow. It could be other things. It could also be low testosterone. So I think you know these these modern day men, if they want to create the ideal archetype of of like feeling alpha dominant going out and actually wanting to go on dates and wanting to meet women and wanting to interact and and wanting to procreate like those men are the ones that have high testosterone it's, it can be very difficult for men to display those behaviors if they're biologically not engineered to even do so you know? so true and i think there's so much going on in modern life psychologically and in terms of that can take up our time i completely understand why there is that concern of like not maybe going out and chasing dates, not using your time to do the thing. And like, I think you've spoken before about Genghis Khan, for example, like he's like your, he's your, your archetypical man that was like building, conquering, chasing women, like having his way with like the world to like create a legacy. We all don't want to go that far, but you want to channel your inner, inner Genghis to some extent in terms of acting as a, a, a masculine man can and should and what he might be capable of. Mm, yeah, no, exactly. And I think in addition to that, um, society is very much to blame here as well with this whole toxic masculinity aspect. I think um, without going into it in too much detail, but I think a lot of men are feeling like they can't actually be the man that they actually want to become because they feel like, you know, they have to suppress those behaviors or they can't like lead or dominate and things like that as well. Com completely agree. And, and that's why the rise of figures like an Andrew Tate or even on maybe a, a more intellectual level, a, a Jordan Peterson has been so prevalent because it spoke to young men that they should lean into what they're capable of. And one of the previous Australian guests that I spoke to is a chap called Johnny Starr, who was well known in the in the, in the fitness industry and in, 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 over in Australia. And he was one of the original Gymshark athletes. That's how I got to know Johnny back in the day. And he was speaking about how empowering it was to hear Jordan Peterson talk about men should be monsters, but they should be capable of channeling that behavior and controlling the monster. And I think that's a really great analogy. Like we should be capable of like absolute war and demolition and destruction, but we should be optimizing for peace, keeping it under control and only tapping into that kind of primal nature when we need it, whether it's training, whether it's in business, we should only have it like a switch that we can turn on, but some guys don't have the switch. They don't have the engine. Yeah, it's a big, it's a, it's a massive, massive issue. And then what happens is they lean towards, so because they don't have the infrastructure to actually synthesize like dopamine and testosterone, where are they going to get it from? Now they're going to lean towards drugs, stimulants, like things that are pre-workouts, things that are artificially raising levels that they should actually have. So guys that are like relying upon pre-workouts to train, we see that quite often. Those are the guys that are like burning their adrenals. They're, they're, they don't have a good HPA axis functioning. Um, they're not synthesizing enough dopamine at baseline which is crucial for all of the benefits we see with testosterone. And so they're leaning towards like living on, you know, lots of stimulants just to get through the day. And this is inevitably going to lead to burnout. Like that's once they hit, you know, mid thirties, late forties, like they're just going to burn out at that pace. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting one. Cause I think nowadays we have a really low tolerance for boredom. I think that a lot of that comes from our smartphones, 
But I find that with friends that maybe can't not have a vape or can't have a like one of these kind of snusses that, that go in your gum for nicotine or, or whatever else as well. And I've spoken to many guests that use nicotine as a performance enhancer in terms of when they're deep work and they're writing. But when you become reliant on these things, like I can't possibly train unless I have 300 mega caffeine and a ton of beta alanine. That's a that's a real red flag that your body is either not recovering through sleep or through other areas, or that you've not got these different stores and hormones that we want to be tapping into, Lucas, that unlock so much natural power. And I think that's a it's a it's a much more empowering and reassuring place to be when you've got these things that you can tap into and you aren't reliant all the whole time on these external um, sources. In addition to that, you see these um inf- like influencers or people that speak to these young men about it's all in your mind but I, I when when people say like it's all in your mindset i can understand that mindset is important particularly for like tr- like going to train when you don't really feel like it that's a mindset thing i can understand that but the mindset and the willpower actually comes from dopamine and and testosterone so if you don't have these raw materials for actually creating willpower, how do you expect young men to actually like generate that willpower? They just physically can't, you know? That's so interesting because we were chatting before we hit record about where our respective podcasts are and the stuff that we do. And I do a solo podcast every 10 episodes. Every episode ending in nine is pretty much a solo Q&A from Instagram. And so many of the questions about how do you fit so much in? How do you do so much? And I really believe that while, of course, I'm partial to an energy drink or some caffeine or whatever, I'm quite reliant on my internal hormones to fall back on those natural resources, those raw materials that you spoke about there to get the thing done because I want to. Like, I really fucking want to. And yeah, when I'm falling back on those and it's pushing me forward, it makes a lot of sense that I'm potentially doing quote unquote more than the average person because I'm looking after those things in the background and absolutely there's an element of nature and there's maybe some predispositions that I have within my biology and my upbringing and my social circumstances. But if I'm ticking some boxes to make sure that I've got the opportunity to tap into the resources, there's a reason that I can jump up at this time and feel prepped and prepared to have a great conversation with you. And then I'm going out for a quick walk and then I'm going into my day job and then I'm training at lunchtime and then I'm doing more podcast work after that. And then, and then I'm, maybe I'll go to the, go to the spa and the sauna and see the, see, see the guys in the evening as well. Like I'm fitting a lot in because I'm looking after these other areas and I'm falling back on these resources rather than potentially just running around stemmed out my head all day. Oh man. I mean, if I also were to look back on like the development and and progression of my own company and business, like looking back now, I mean, I've recorded over 600 YouTube videos each, you know, eight to 10 minutes each, you know, 200 podcasts at least. And then over like 500 Instagram posts and being featured on like over 200 different podcasts. Like there's no possible way I could have done that with low testosterone. Absolutely no way. It's it's a really tangible thing. And one of the most popular videos on your channel, on your YouTube uh, channel, where you put out over 600 videos, which I've, I've got huge admiration for. That's incredible. You built your natural testosterone to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter, and that's the typical measurement that people should be using as their language. What was involved in getting to that level? Yeah, so first and foremost, let's um, we'll, we'll quickly discuss like the reference ranges for men so they can understand what that's all about. So... What's happening when, when we said before about, you know, you're not the man your grandfather was, what's happened nowadays is the testosterone reference range has actually reduced because of the average decline in testosterone levels. So it used to go up to around 1,300, 1,400, but now they've reduced it down to around, I think, 1,100 for most, for most blood testing facilities. Now, in saying that, Colin, I mean, my mission was just to max out testosterone as as high as possible naturally, utilizing herbs, utilizing supplements, utilizing specific exercises, use um, advanced dietary practices, you know, icing, all these different biohacks. And so, if we look at where I managed to get my my levels to, I mean, there were many different factors contributing to that. I wouldn't say it's like just one single thing that I did. You know, there's many different you know, factors that contributed to that. But I think first and foremost, from an exercise standpoint, 
doing some form of heavy weight training session, you know, two to three times per week. And I mean like six to eight reps on like squatting, deadlifting, bench pressing, like these are going to really move the needle. The body adjusts and adapts to this sort of exercise and it starts to, you know, create a response in response to these um, activities. The body releases more of these anabolic hormones. And I know um, weight so training is a big think, factor as well, isn't it? Um, in terms of specifically if you're doing those movements. Yeah, yeah, absolutely as well. Like um, it's going to be a major contributing factor. Um, so in addition to that, I think the sleep is crucial as well. So you, you would understand this, you know, the importance of getting at least seven to eight hours of high quality sleep per night. Um yeah, and even you know the specific dietary methods that I that I applied as well. Yeah, you know, mostly aiming for those monounsaturated fats and the saturated fats. So things like macadamias, Brazil nuts, uh, avocados, olive oil, butter. You know, these are high quality fat sources and things like that. What about things like um, eggs, Lucas, or fatty <clears throat> meats? Do they ever form part of your diet? Absolutely. I mean, eggs are a staple in my diet at the moment. Um, and even plenty of red meat like steak, you know, I was consuming a lot of organ meats back in the day as well. I don't do it as much now, but cause it's like not the, not the nicest of the, of taste, but, um, yeah, like I was consuming quite a lot of chicken hearts, liver, kidney. Um, I've seen people supplement that are- instead though. Um, so if you maybe don't want it to form part of your meal, I have seen people take liver supplements. It's not something I've dabbled with, but uh, I've been interested in what the potential upsides of that would be. Definitely, yeah, a versatile way to benefit from these um, these bioavailable nutrients that are found in liver, kidney, spleen, tongue, heart, testes. You know, these these organ meats, they really do contain some powerful nutrients that can stimulate the body's production of testosterone. I mean, if you look at chicken hearts, for example, chicken hearts are really high in coenzyme Q10. Now, coenzyme Q10 is not that, you can't get coenzyme Q10 from like vegan vegetarian sources. Good luck with that. Um, You know, it's going to be very hard to get that from any other food. And then also in addition to that, it's very high in cholesterol. Now, as you would also understand that cholesterol is forms the building block of all the hormones in the body, which is one of the reasons why going on a low fat diet is actually problematic for testosterone production. It's remarkable though, the different narratives we see in the press though, like, oh, high cholesterol will lead to heart disease. And you're like, yes, depending on what type of cholesterol, depending on what sort of situation you're in. And so like we, 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 pivot between low carb and low fat diets being seen as the most optimal by the mainstream media and you could genuinely take two newspapers or two blog articles uh, day to day next to each other and they would have contrasting information in it and it would all just be scare stories and I appreciate that some of what we've gone through is a little bit intimidating at times in terms of like, oh shit I, may, I need to make all these changes but there is tangible benefits the other side both from studies but also anecdotally as well which I find like a much more reassuring like facts tell stories sell so uh, that yeah. that for me is what what, what what the game's all around just on the the exercise piece as well uh, i'm standing for for this podcast i do for all my podcasts i stand for a lot of meetings and um, in in work as well one from like a a verbal fluency perspective and an energy perspective but also from uh I'm going to say strain, but strain being like a, a very low level perspective you're on your walking treadmill while we record as well there is absolutely something to be said for guys that are moving their bodies regularly whether it's in high intensity or low intensity like we're doing just now there's benefits on the other side of that what are some of the the kind of key things that stand out to you in that regard yeah that's a great you know that's a really important point to mention here is the um the importance of these micro amounts of movement they're called um non-exercise activity thermogenesis or neat which I'm sure you've seen Jeff Nippard and, and um, a few other Peter Atia and other experts talk about as well. You know, the, the, this, this type of exercise, which is like, for example, standing up or doing like 15 to 20,000 steps per day on, on the treadmill desk. Um, you know, this basically what this is doing right now is the reason why I'm doing it, first of all, is because I had a pretty big meal. I had my dinner just before this podcast. 
And I know with tracking my blood sugar response, utilizing a um, continuous glucose monitor, a CGM device, I've seen what happens to my blood sugar levels after using going for a walk after a meal, which you've you know probably heard Stan Efferding talk about, you know, 15 minute walk after a meal being super effective. I've seen what happens. And basically what happens is your blood sugar levels don't spike as high. Um, and if we look at the, you know, why do we even want this in the first place? Why do we not want the blood sugar to spike too high? Well, it's because when blood sugar levels spike, so does insulin. And insulin can put the handbrakes on testosterone production indirectly, not directly, but it can actually over time, if your body slowly becomes insulin resistant, that's not only going to affect your pumps in the gym, but it's also going to affect your testosterone production as well. So this is, it's important to blend both very high intensity training with this, you know, low intensity steady state training. However, it is very crucial to understand that um, marathon training or very ultra long distance running, this is a guaranteed way to lower testosterone levels. Like any sort of ultra dis ultra long duration activities like that can actually lower testosterone levels. I think fantastic points, and I know you've actually spoken about sprints and almost hit training as well being something that's that, that's favorable for testosterone production. Not something I I I, I do much of whatsoever, but I I do know there there is some some backing to it too. Yeah, actually, I just did a sprinting session today at lunchtime. So I actually did like 20 reps of about 50 meter bouts. So it's quite quite an extensive session. But um, if you do like high intensity sprinting training like that, if you want to like get super lean, like that is one way to do it. Like sprint training will definitely get you shredded. Um, but in addition to that, it's also been shown to stimulate the production of testosterone, growth hormone, and DHT. Yeah, it's, it, it is exciting from that perspective. There's so many natural tools in our, in our armory when it comes to, to food, to nutrition, to sleep. But of course, many people will want to talk about things like supplementation. What are some of the ones that are, are front of your mind, Lucas? Yeah, so when it comes to supplementation, I mean, this is an area that I'm extremely passionate about. And this is actually really what got me into the whole like biohacking space. I mean, I used to work in my dad's pharmacy as like the vitamin specialist. So I had a lot of experience understanding vitamin D, you know, vitamin C, vitamin K. I started to understand the benefits of these vitamins whilst I was studying naturopathy. So I was like learning at school plus working in my dad's pharmacy. Um, when it comes to supplements for testosterone production, there are many different applications for different compounds. So for example, if a guy has suboptimal levels of vitamin D, simply replenishing vitamin D through supplement form can actually lead to an increase in testosterone. That's one example. If you're looking at vitamin K2, there's some pretty decent studies looking at how vitamin K2 of M, uh, the MK7 form, um, that by itself can also help with testosterone production. And then another mineral known as boron, which I think you've also been you know, accustomed, you're, you're accustomed to as well. Um, boron is a trace mineral that in dosages between three to 10 milligrams per day can actually decrease sex hormone binding globulin and increase free testosterone levels in healthy adults. So there's a few, few uh, gems there. Yeah, interesting, because I've heard you describe vitamin D as a, a hormone before, and I... Mm been taking it for many many years now but i spoke out quite publicly about it during the c19 period as, as as a very important thing for the immune system and particularly when you're shut indoors for long periods and you're not getting sunlight and in scotland we don't get a lot of sunlight or enough we don't get enough vitamin d from natural sunlight for large periods of the year probably about eight eight, eight or nine months which is a significant period you do need to supplement pretty heavily and when you speak about it as a hormone, I think it actually gets people a bit more excited about the potential upside of it as well, because it doesn't just affect the kind of traditional stuff like um, immune system or bones. It's actually having an impact on your production within your system too. Yeah, it's a, I mean, if you look at it like this, I mean, anyone that's taking vitamin D is on hormone replacement therapy, HRT. You know, you could, you could look at it like that. But I think, you know, vitamin D is a secu steroid hormone and that, that one there is like, 
it can influence over a thousand different genes in the body. So it can turn on and off bad genes. Um, it can, you know, assist with the production of immune cells. Um, it helps with the conversion of cholesterol into testosterone. There's so many different benefits of vitamin D. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one supplement I really want to speak to you about, and I think Huberman and Derek More Plates More Dates have done a lot for this in particular, is, is Tonka Ali. Um, I mm-hmm. purchased my first batch of Tonka Ali five weeks ago. I haven't had blood tests done awesome. since then because it needs to be given time. But I'm very interested in what happens with that. Tonka Ali is without a doubt one of the most effective herbal supplements to support testosterone production. And it can do it through some pretty interesting pathways. Now, with herbal supplements, we don't know super well how these how these herbs actually work in the human body. We have a lot of animal studies and in vivo, in vitro studies, but what Tonkatali appears to do is it actually can help to block the negative feedback loop that occurs from the testes back to the brain and actually helps the body to synthesize even more testosterone. Um, And it can also do this possibly by interacting with the dopamine system as well. Um, There's a few like peptide molecules or these um, alkaloids that are found within Tonkara Ali, um, which basically appear to possess highly potent dopaminergic properties. And by virtue of stimulating the dopamine system, it's probably lowering prolactin as well. So we're seeing that benefit there as as well. One of the things and one of the reasons that you were a guest I was so keen to get into this with is you understand the different hormones that it's interacting with as well. So you've spoken there about dopamine, you've spoken there about prolactin. One of the things that comes up in my blood test every time is they they talk about your thyroid function as well. So it's really important to understand that there's other things interacting within your system rather than just this one hormone that we're potentially optimizing for. There's other things that if one part of the body isn't firing the way it should then best believe we need to get it firing so that the so that the testosterone can reach its potential as well so i I find that really really valuable let's talk about dosages and like potential sources for things like tonka ali please yeah so tonka ali i mean looking at different dosages we've got usually ideally we're aiming for a 100 to 1 extract Um, and ideally we're roughly looking for about two percent of the uricominone so the the uricominone is considered to be the like the the active constituent found in tonkarali um one thing to to keep in mind is that tonkarali is actually one of the most heavily um faked supplements including turkesterone that's another example and and ectosterones um but tonkarali because it's extremely bitter i don't know if you've ever opened up the capsule um it's it's very it's very very it's like one of the most bitter herbs ever. Um, some companies are actually using saw dust, like actual dust, and they're cutting their tonkatali with like fake. They're faking their tonkatali with saw dust. So, um, got to be really careful with sourcing. In terms of good brands, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Nootropics Depot. They're from the US. They're one of the biggest Nootropics resellers in the US. Um, and then also another company called Lost Empire Herbs. They're based in the US as well. They've got a really good powdered formulation of Tonkara Lee. Excellent. And when it comes to to dosage, um, I know there was a, a study that you critiqued that was talking about Tonkara Lee potentially being toxic, but the dosages they were using yeah. were absolutely wild, were they not? Exactly. I mean, you look at these rat studies. I mean, if you do the conversion to human, the human uh, human equivalent dosage, it would have been equivalent to like taking twenty capsules at once, which is just insane amounts. Like, no, no, no one's to, no one's no one's mega dosing tonkatali in that in that high doses. What um what typically uh, is a I don't want to say safe, but what's a recommended dose for somebody to consider when it comes to tonkatali? Yeah, usually between 100 to 200 milligrams. That's typically, you know, the suggested daily dosage. You can bump it up to around 400 milligrams, but it depends upon the potency of the extract and then also the individual subjective response. Because some guys, when they use Tonkarali, they report slight agitation or slight irritability or feeling slightly, um, ironically, slightly more aggressive. But um, that might be due to some of the the effects that it can have on some of the brain chemicals like norepinephrine 
um, GABA and things like that. Yeah, exactly that. I, I think it's going to be really interesting. I uh, I got my, my, my last test was maybe June last year, my last blood test, and it was around... 690 um in nanograms per deciliter with 64 percent free testosterone so reasonable but by no means high if we're talking about a thousand for 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 yourself so i'm interested in seeing what would happen with tonka ali as the sole variable really that i've changed because my lifestyles remained largely the same in terms of the boxes that i'm ticking was it just the additional Tonkara Lee? That's like the only new variable, or would you stack it with any other supplements? Um, I've looked at a uh, Fiducio Agrestis, um, which again is like a yep. very much a, a Huberman slash um, Derek Moore plates more dates thing they talk about. And I've even looked at um, Derek's own product from, is it Gorilla? It's called Sigma from Gorilla, Gorilla Mind. That's got that. Yep. Tonka Ali Ashwagandha, I think, might be in it as well. Um, um, yeah. which which uh, but um one of my friends has used that and he has to cycle off every four weeks because he says the fifth week he feels like shit so you've heard of that side effect that i've that i've spoken about it, yeah it, well my, my friend has literally used it um use sigma mind and for four weeks he's flying and the fifth week he's like get off this thing now and then he's ready to go again yeah. yeah so that's um this is a notorious side effect associated with ashwagandha um ashwagandha can in- exert this really nasty side effect which is known as like anhedonia which is a blunting of the pleasure response so like the body doesn't actually respond to pleasure like it used to so there's more of a numbing effect on the emotion so yeah it's a side effect that is starting to get more attention but i think um you know nowadays most guys are cautious yeah it's it, that that is interesting but yeah i would consider um uh fiduja aggressive as well like what's your take on that Fedosia agrestis is one of the most potent herbal supplements that I've ever tried personally. I mean, when I first started using Fedosia, I thought it was spiked with Viagra. Um, like I felt... It, it yeah, massively felt spikes awesome. sperm production, is that right? Yeah, massive, massive increases in luteinizing hormones, sperm counts, sperm motility. Like you'll be shooting ropes with Fedosia agrestis. That stuff is potent. That's that's that, that's, <laughs> that's 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 mad. But does that form part of your stack nowadays to to get towards a thousand? Um, so when I first did my blood test to reach that level, I actually wasn't using Fedosia. I was using Sistanch, Tonkarali, pine pollen, mm. um, mega doses of taurine. Some I was using. I was going outside in the sun, so I didn't need vitamin D. I was using baby doses of zinc, and then I was also using a little bit of vitamin B one as well, which accelerates, you know, glucose oxidation. But yeah, that were the that were like the main supplements that I was leaning towards. Interesting. And in the time we've got together, I need to ask you about icing because not something I've ever considered. <laughs> but one of your most played videos in your channel is about that. And I know a lot of the guys that you work with are, are, are really in that space as well. Talk me through it. Yeah. So whenever I first mention icing your balls, most guys just look at me funnily and then just like, go oh, like, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, why should I ice my balls? And really this practice comes back to, um, I actually discovered it on a, on a bodybuilding forum when I was looking at different practices and protocols that, you know, these Olympic powerlifters were deploying before their lifts. And they said that these Russian powerlifters were actually icing their balls before going out to break a PB. So I was like, hmm, you know, there must be something to this. And then I looked up, you know, the research on nocturnal scrotal cooling or like cooling down the, the testes. And all of the research was done on fertility. So if you look at all the research on testicular cooling or keeping the ball sack cool, you know, majority of that research is on fertility. Now, things that usually enhance fertility, some like sometimes they'll have a positive effect on testosterone production. So anyway, I remember it was actually New Year's Eve 2021. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give this a crack. I'm going to do it every single day for 12 weeks. I'm going to ice my balls before bed. And just for the guys listening in, we're not actually applying ice directly onto the skin. We're actually, you know, putting it up against the jocks or, or underwear. Um, and I was doing that for like 10 to 15 minutes per night before bed, you know, and before, and I did blood work before and after, and just by icing alone, 
I saw about a 150 to 200 point increase in my testosterone levels, which was absolutely insane. And, you know, I made a video about it on my YouTube channel. And now there's so many comments of guys reporting benefits. Like a lot of guys are doing blood work before and after. And we've come to the conclusion that um, the ideal icing protocol is about 10 to 15 minutes, two to three times two to three times a day. And ideally you want to do that before the gym, for sure before the gym, because you want to, you know, train insane. And then also before bed. So doing it before bed and before the gym. And then if you can get another session in whilst you're at, you're at work, that's a, an added bonus. One, one of the reasons that I was the most keen to ask about this is I'm someone that's always on and like busy and hectic. And I've been using the sauna more recently uh, at, at, at the spa mm. that I'm at. And it's been good to get me into a parasympathetic state, to chill out, to relax. It's been good for recovery for my body. But I do know that it potentially can have a downside for my natural testosterone levels. And I was wondering, like, almost like almost like considering offsetting versus time in the sauna versus icing of the testes, because I do know that heat uh, can have a negative impact. It's why I don't typically go in the hot tub. Um, I, I, would, I would go sauna, cold dip, rather than, than, uh, than anything else. Yeah, so typically heat does have the opposite effect. It can actually hinder male fertility. And in fact, it can, you know, significantly decrease sperm count and also potentially increase prolactin. So one thing that I always emphasize to men is, you know, if they're going to use the sauna frequently, um, they got to bring an ice pack in there. Despite how embarrassing it's going to be if you're in a public sauna, you just say, you know, I'm boosting I'm boosting my biology. You can just say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and if you if you want to have outlandish results in a world where people are increasingly average or below average then you maybe have to do something a little bit different and i think people need to be more comfortable to lean into that as well and um, you mentioned cortisol when it came to you deciding to to walk on the treadmill to help you digest your dinner and get moving what's the relationship between cortisol and testosterone generally speaking cortisol has an antagonistic or supp uh, suppressive effect on testosterone production so they say it's because it's borrowing from the same resources or materials, so cholesterol being the starting backbone. Um, but what happens is the body prioritizes its resources away from the synthesis of these, um, these protective or adaptive hormones like testosterone. And what happens is it shuttles it towards the fight or flight hormones like cortisol, adrenaline. Um, and so... One thing that I've got to mention, when I got my testosterone levels, you know, to a, a thousand, you know, near a thousand, I was also taking a lot of compounds that suppress cortisol. So I was deliberately pushing down my cortisol levels through different vitamins, different supplements and compounds. And that in virtue would have like by virtue would have had a, you know, a positive effect on testosterone production as well. Interesting, because I very much view cortisol as the stress hormone, and I view stress as a good thing at times. But when cortisol is too high, of course, it it, it tips into the in, tips into the negative. What what are your recommendations for managing cortisol? Then, of course, going for walks after dinner, etc. For example, is like a lifestyle intervention. But what else would you call out? Yeah, so another great example would be um, high dose magnesium. Mm. So this is commonly prescribed. You know, most people probably like one in one in two of your listeners would be taking a magnesium supplement. Um, but looking at different compounds like L-theanine, taurine, glycine. You know, taurine. We're looking at dosages between three to five grams, which is you know relatively high dosage. Glycine you can use around five grams, which tastes amazing. I, I, not sure if you've ever tried it. Um, you know, there's other compounds like phosphatidylserine that also has a, you know, a positive effect on lowering cortisol. And then you can also use some other adaptogenic herbs like lemon balm extract, uh, chamomile tea. Um, yeah, there's a few other compounds like that that can help to suppress the cortisol. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I think, of course, there's like lifestyle factors you would want to consider, but it's interesting you call it magnesium because it is so commonly used and a lot of people consider it like a, a sleep supplement as well, but it has to be, um, you say glycine? 
It could be either, yeah, magnesium glycinate or magnesium taurate. And then there's another form called magnesium l 3 8 which is also highly beneficial. Okay, excellent. Because I, I think sometimes people just look at the label and they're like, oh, magnesium, that's me sorted. And you're like, okay, well, you need to know like the devils in the detail when it comes to these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that's actually, that's actually another really important point when it comes to supplementation. And this is something that I like try and educate a lot on is the different forms that companies use and the dosages that they use. You know, you'll see supplement companies sell like taurine in capsules of like 500 milligrams. And on the serving size, on the serving, on the, the back of the, the bottle will say like two capsules per serving when mm-hmm. that's only about a thousand milligrams. When really to get the beneficial effects, you need to go all the way up to 3000 to 5000 milligrams. It, 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 exactly that. And I had a full episode during the, during the C19 period on vitamin D and I was saying how many people were like taking the supplement was like a thousand IU and you were like there is no way a thousand IU is doing anything for you unless you're getting direct sunlight on a, on a regular basis and people just need to consider consider these things from that perspective one of the last things I want to ask you Lucas while we're together is about DHT you mentioned it during this conversation some of the audience will be familiar with it as almost the hair wash hormone and a factor in from that perspective but let's get into it All right. So when it comes to DHT, uh, dihydrotestosterone, this is the hormone that testosterone gets converted into. So I said before, testosterone can go down either the estrogen pathway or down the DHT pathway. Now, DHT does have an association with hair loss and also prostate enlargement. But if we look at the consequences associated with suppressing DHT, we're going to see symptoms associated with some of the like side effects that men complain about when they have low testosterone. So lack of confidence, you know, um, DHT can have an anxiolytic effect, which means it can reduce anxiety. Um, and so DHT is one of those hormones that I actually think most men now, like most men can actually benefit from actually increasing. Um, and you know, this is a hormone that I consider as a protective adaptive hormone. Um, and in addition to estrogen, a lot of guys think that estrogen is, you know, extremely harmful, but estrogen is also important in men. This is why it really comes back to understanding how to read your blood work. And it's all about the ratio of these hormones, you know, in symphony, in symphony with one another. Yeah. There's, there's like a, there's a place for all these things at the table, but we just have to be understanding of the balance between the, between the two of the three. Um, Cards on the table, I've used finasteride for about nine or 10 years now. And I know friends that have used it and had to immediately stop because of the depressive thoughts that they've had. Touch wood, I have been <clears throat> pretty rock solid. I don't think I'm particularly predisposed to that type of um, side effect anyway. But when I first started getting my bloods done to check my test levels, I was fascinated to see what my test levels would look like based on the fact that I've been blocking DHT relatively successfully in terms of on a percentage thing that you could take do tasteride which is a, like even even stronger than that to, to, to block dht almost entirely but i was fascinated to see whether it would be blunting one my test levels or also like my my free uh, testosterone percentage as well yeah that's a that's a great example because um not every guy that uses these dht blockers notices major side effects um but most men that i've seen They've either used finasteride or other oral um, DHT blocking medication or compounds, and they have noticed side effects. Um, and there's an entire forum called the post finasteride syndrome. Um, you know, it's a big, it's a really big problem. It's huge. For, it, for it's so men. strong. It's so strong, Lucas. So, like, it, you're fighting against <laughs> your your entire your entire genetics and hormones to hold <laughs> on to your hair. So you need to understand that. And for for me, it came about because I was looking at getting a hair transplant, and they were like, "Well, if you get a hair transplant, you will be taking finasteride thereafter because you'd be implanting in front of where the loss would be happening behind it, and you would get a bit of a, a, a funky look." So I was like, "Right, okay, we'll, we'll we'll crack on with it." So my brother and I both used it for like nine maybe almost 10 years now and i've I've both built like excellent physiques both have excellent drive and and energy but wow like if you if it like if you get some of the downsides of it it is it is is killer is literally it is literally tanking your 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 ability to produce testosterone i would guess yeah 100 percent. but lucas we have covered so much ground 
And there's loads of other areas that you and I can talk from a biohacking perspective, and I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to do a round two. But if people want to continue the conversation with you, where should they head towards? Yeah, um, appreciate the invite, man. I'm going to have to get you on my podcast as well. But um, they can find me at Boost Your Biology on YouTube. Go over there and subscribe. Like I said at the start, I've filmed over 600 videos there, and I've put in a lot of time and effort into building that channel. Just cracked the 50K subs. So, you know, pretty happy about that. The goal is a million. So one twentieth of the way there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thanks for the invite, Colin. It was a pleasure chatting. Amazing, Lucas. That'll be linked in the show notes. Thank you so much to you, Lucas. And thank you to you, the listener. I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon. So some of the main symptoms of low testosterone, first of all, would be increased body fat. So most men that have low testosterone levels actually find it easier to put on weight. Testosterone promotes pro-social behaviors, but I think a lot of men are feeling like they can't actually be the man that they actually want to become because they feel like they have to suppress those behaviors or they can't like lead or dominate and things like that. My mission was just to max out testosterone as, as high as possible naturally. If you want to like get super lean, like that is one way to do it. Like sprint training will definitely get you shredded. When it comes to supplements for testosterone production, there are many different applications for different compounds. So for example, 